Good afternoon, colleagues online and in the room. Uh, you are very welcome. And we are here to discuss housing, land and property rights uh, for CCCM uh, practice. And I'm Jim Robinson. I'm the uh, co-coordinator for the Global Housing, Land and Property uh, Responsibility, um, along with uh, UN Habitat. I'm with NRC. And we co-lead the uh, AOR and um, this session is jointly hosted by us and the CCCM cluster and uh, I have here in the room in Geneva um, uh, Juan and Dare, their cluster coordinators um, who are with us today. So we're going to be recording the session, I'll say that straight up so um, so that we can share this uh, beyond this this afternoon or this morning or this evening wherever you are but so we can share this in the future and just to say a brief word of, of uh, what this will be looking at, we're going to be uh, focused on um, tools and uh, ways to support CCCM practice that focus on housing, land and property. So part of that is work that's been done to develop uh, an HLP toolkit. And we have uh, 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 Melina uh, on, online to discuss that with us. We have um, Abire Lopez, who's the uh, Global HLP Advisor for IOM, to also talk about uh, what HLP looks like in CCCM practice, um, as well as to offer some insights into other training that's coming up. And um, I think I even have a slide with the agenda on it. There we go. So you can see. Um, and just a couple of small kind of housekeeping uh, comments, really. Um, I've said we'll be recording. Um, if you're in the room and want to want me to pause at any point, just say, um, and I will. Um, we're going to have plenty of time for questions and discussions. So this is about getting some feedback on, on something we've been developing, but also hearing your thoughts on what we're presenting here today. Uh, so please note down any questions you have. Um, of course, online, please use the, the chat function to either set out questions or to introduce yourselves. And um, yeah, so we'll have time for discussion at the end. And um, but before I go any further, just want to say, yeah, welcome. Thank you for being here. We're going to hear now from uh, Dare Hayu, who's the, um, the cluster coordinator for CCCM from the UNHCR side. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about HLP and CCCM, uh, sharing some thoughts on why it's relevant. Um, Dare, over to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, colleagues here and the colleagues uh, online, uh, wherever you are. Good afternoon, good morning and good evening. Um, First, I don't know what does the red light here means, whether the mic is open or not, but I assume that colleagues on the other side um, are able to uh, hear us uh, from, from here. If you could confirm, that would be great. Uh, yes, all right, thank you. Um, well, first, again, let me just introduce myself. I'm one of the two global cluster coordinators for CCCM. Uh, one is sitting here next to me uh, from, from um, uh, IOM. And uh, I think uh, I know the the majority of the of the colleagues here and many of the colleagues who are joining us um, online. Uh, Jimmy, thank you for, for giving me and for giving us this opportunity, first of all. And uh, second, thanks to the colleagues who have been working very hard on developing different tools and guidelines to um, enlighten our way uh, in the in the HLP um, uh, field uh, for CCCM cluster in particular. Um, it is very difficult to tell anyone in this room things that they don't know. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's not easy to uh, to know where to start. But I just wanted to drive some of uh, personal experiences and thinking for us as a global CCCM cluster on the HLP aspects. Is first why it is important. The CCCM is cross cutting by nature. Um, um, it is a very interesting work that we do, but also sometimes the challenge is that there are some important integral aspects of CCCM where we cannot move if we don't really take them into consideration. And one of these very important pillar is the house, land and property. Um, in particular, the thinking that I, I see why this is very, very important because in the IDP context, um, the vast majority of the areas we are covering are informal IDP settlements. That is very different from the non-IDP context, i.e. refugee context, where the uh, settlement of IDPs go through a certain level of control where the government is able to manage where to host the refugees. In the IDP context, 
Mainly, uh, access is challenged, whether it is conflict or natural disaster. And IDPs often don't have many options but to identify a location for themselves. In many, many cases, the location that is identified could, in some cases, start as an issue where you don't have HLP aspects, but sometimes it expands by default because this area is one of the few safe areas. It expands, then you will find yourself in a situation where you have lots of house and land and property. One of the main challenges we have been facing that the humanitarian actors, the donors, uh, even the uh, government counterparts, the host community, uh, come to criticize the actors, say, why are you operating in areas where you have house, land, and property? And then we end up in this very dilemmatic humanitarian situation between humanitarian imperatives and uh, applying the principles and rights of the people. I have personally ended up in many situations where actually the individual landowner came to me to say that as a CCCM cluster coordinator, I ask you to retain my right as an individual and to kick the IDPs out of this place. Then you don't know what to tell to those people, apart of the fact that you advocate with them. Or a donor came to me in several occasions and said, I'm not ready to fund this area because I am hearing about lots of issues. And as we speak about many, many evolving priorities for the humanitarians, for example, when we speak about localization, I still sometimes feel that localization could have different interpretations, sometimes not correct, sometimes very correct, but the question is that are IDPs local actors wherever they are? To a certain extent, yes, and to other extent, no, because IDPs sometimes experience many tensions with the host communities because of HLP-related issues. Here, the localization aspect comes, so if we are not going to address this, we are not going to really address the localization within uh, uh, the IDPs and in the areas where they are doing. We will not be able to address the host community relationships. We will not be able to discuss anything about the area-based approaches and the needs-based approach in these locations without um, uh, uh, addressing the HLP aspect. So to this end, there have been many, many uh, uh, work that has been done by the colleagues. Uh, and Jimmy, you have been also leading the fort on, on many aspects, and I think it simply also tells, probably in the end of the session, it, it tells a lot how are we close to each other. I mean, if we think that sometimes the HLP, AOR, and the CCM cluster, the proximity is very, very close because I understand that above CCCM, there are many HLP issues that you are working on, but probably there is really a big and heavy bunch that is related specifically to the IDPs living in the um, IDP settlements in, in, in the internal displacement context. Now, also from a different perspective, sometimes people and donors and communities question, what is the magnitude of this issue? The magnitude of this issue is simply reflected by the number of IDPs living in informal settlements. And this represents between 20 to 23% of the IDPs. We cannot hear you anymore. You're muted. Thank you. Okay, colleagues. <laughs> um, I hope now you can hear me. Um, great. Thank you, uh, uh, Medina. So the magnitude, I don't know where did you stop hearing me, but the magnitude is very, very high sometimes. We really should not um, uh, uh, undermine it because the total number of IDPs, according to our 2022 analysis, that live in IDP size is between 20 to 23% of the total number of IDPs. So basically the work we are doing is addressing the needs at least of the quarter of the total displaced communities. That is very, very um, large number. I think what we are looking forward is uh, to uh, bring these guidelines, these tools that we have worked in into uh, a practice, um, really start first uh, piloting them in different countries, but also make sure that they become a part of our training packages, our briefings to the donors, and our also um, uh, uh, briefings to the new cluster coordinators, sector coordinators, uh, whether at national or subnational levels, so they are fully aware of this uh, 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 of this work that has been developed by the different colleagues and are able 
to implement it. But in the meantime, I think also part of it still um, remains uh, as a, a work in progress, as a living document, because we have to accept that there is always a space for us to learn from the different contexts and to see what would be the best ways and the best practices to address them. Sometimes still there are new methods that we are hearing from the uh, colleagues in the field and local actors on how to improve our response. So we have also to be very much open and the recipient to, uh, to hear and learn, adjust and uh, change as needed. With this, if you allow me, I will stop and hand back the uh, mic to Jimmy. If, you, if any colleague also has any questions, please you lead the sessions. We are, we are staying here, so it will be very also interesting for us and we will learn from you about your points and the questions. So over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks for those, those comments. I think it's worth sort of reiterating how, although, you know, in the coordination and cluster system, we have the HLP AOR sits within the, the protection cluster, um, but, you know, very often where the the work of around HLP gets really real, <laughs> as it were, is, is, is working with shelter colleagues, with CCCM cluster colleagues, you know, really who are engaging with communities on the ground, facing uh, the challenges firsthand, and are often a really brilliant way and source of understanding what some of the key issues are. So like I know on my recent like visit to Somalia, that was it was the CCCM colleagues who were highlighting some of the issues that we were then trying to respond to, you know, both as NRC and other organisations, but but with the with the cluster as well. So uh, this is a partnership that's necessary as a cluster and AOR and something we're looking to sort of deepen and develop and uh, find good ways of working together. And just worth stating as well, the questions that come from CCCM colleagues are uh, often the real sort of cutting edge sort of leading questions that we need to really consider. So um, please keep raising the challenges you face and uh, uh, the, the questions that come up and we need to try and find responses to those from, from the HLP side. Uh, and of course, like looking broadly to see uh, yeah, who, how we can do that better. So yeah, really appreciate that. Uh, thank you for those those words. And um, yeah, before we uh, hear from uh, Abire and Melina on some of the tools that we've been, been working on, just want to uh, mention that we'll be then turning to colleagues from South Sudan, Mozambique, Honduras and Peru to hear uh, some of the experiences of working with this, this toolkit or, or ways in which it could be useful. So it'll be great to get those, uh, those perspectives and I'm really pleased that, that Melina has, has worked so hard to, to get them here uh, uh, today. So um, thank you for that. And um, yeah, I'm going to hand over now to, um, let me just check my schedule so I get it right. Uh, yeah, Ibere, Ibere Lopez, um, who's the Global HLP Advisor for IOM and also uh, supports the Global Shelter Cluster as well on HLP. Um, Ibere, over to you. All right. Thanks, Jim. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to try to talk a little bit about uh, what I see on the field um, in terms of HRP and CCCM, and a, a little bit of the challenges, but also a little bit of um, the things that these different countries and emergency responses have in common when it comes to um, when it comes to, to HRP challenges and issues um, that CCCM responders face. So. <clears throat> I think there are three uh, grand themes. The first one is uh, due diligence. Due diligence is uh, so. Just uh, let me do a, a, a caveat here. I'm going to say a lot of things that many of you know, but um, because I'm not in the room there, I don't know who is there. So I'm going to assume that some people will benefit from my explaining <laughs> um, some of the the basic uh, ideas. So due diligence is. Uh, the practice of um, verifying uh, land ownership, ver verifying land rights and making sure that a piece of land, for example, has uh, who, who, who owns and who has authority over a piece of land. That's what du due diligence. So due diligence is one of the themes. Uh, security of tenure is the other theme that, that permeates um, CCCM. And the other one is, is eviction, protection against eviction. Thanks, Jim. I'm very uh, honored by that. So in the due, due diligence side, um, CCM practitioners work with IDP camps and refugee camps and, 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 and sites. And, um, and those are usually set up in either in bare green, greenfield land, so bare land, 
or in buildings that are available for uh, occupation. Many times they're public buildings, but they can be private buildings, they can be private land as well. And what I see often is that even when these site, the sites are planned, um, there is not a great amount of effort put into doing the due diligence, finding out who has rights to the land and who might have rights to the land if the land has other claimants, so other people that believe that they own or have any rights to the land. So what we see usually is that the CCCM actors will, um, they have their counterparts in the government, disaster management authority or, uh, or, or an authority of the kind, and they will consult that authority, which will point them to the, the, the land. We'll say, this is the land that we will allocate for the site. Um, and that usually is enough uh, for the actors to uh, start the process of doing the site planning uh, and preparing the, the site for, for the IDPs to live in. But what happens often is that private individuals or even other government agencies will come in afterwards and will say, no, this land is mine or part of this land is mine, or uh, this land has been allocated by the Ministry of Economy for a cement factory, right? And, and so, so and these things, usually the governments that we deal with, they don't do that due diligence either, right? And so what I advocate for uh, in this case is that we as um, CCM and first responders, we do our own verification, our own site due diligence uh, before we invest on a site for, for, for long term. So that's on the due diligence side. Right? Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, in, in, in Nigeria, uh, where you have widespread fraud, so people that uh, obtain fake or falsified um, ownership documents. You have um, a military that has uh, a great deal of authority in the areas in the areas where, where there, there are displacement because the conflict is still active, and so the military has uh, many times overriding authority, the authority that overrides the the local civilian authority. So it doesn't matter how much you negotiate with the local civilian authority and how much um, permission they give you to use a piece of land or or, or building, the, the military can always come after and say no. Right? Um, and in, in and also in Nigeria, you don't have a reliable we don't have reliable sources on ownership of land. You have you have few sources. Some of them are more reliable than others, but we don't have a single reliable source. So it needs uh, in order to do the due diligence, you need to do. Uh, a wide triangulation and cross-checking with different uh, sources of information on the ground. Now, on the security of tenure side, that for CCCM, this is where you have to um, establish the terms and conditions for the the new site or, or the, ex, the, site, the expanded site, so the place where the IDPs will live. Because many times uh, the site is put in place without uh, the terms and conditions being clear, so we don't know how long the people will be able to stay there and under which conditions. Are we going to be able to provide uh, water and sanitation? Are we going to be able to do some uh, permanent infrastructure in that are necessary for, for water and sanitation and, and other needs? Uh, another example from Nigeria, uh, a uh, landowner that was uh, a benevolent landowner, a, a man that was, you know, well regarded in the community, he offered his private lands for the IDPs to settle in the beginning of the crisis. The IDP settled in his land, uh, but then he wasn't expecting it to last so long. So after many years, he and his family, because he has a family that is also interested in the land, uh, he won his land back, right? And the conditions uh, for that to happen were not set in the beginning, and there was no negotiation regarding that. And so, and now uh, we have a problem after a few number of years, um, which also impacts the uh, willingness of the landowner to allow for permanent uh, infrastructure to be put on the land. And the third, oh, sorry, 
Uh, yeah, and the, and the third aspect, uh, which is the protection against eviction, is linked also to the security of tenure. Um, but um, it's another type of work because it's uh, it's more of an advocacy work uh, that needs to be done with the local authorities to avoid uh, forced and um, uh, disorganized, unprepared eviction. Right. So it's common that IDPs will seek refuge in churches or in uh, schools or markets or of other public buildings, and after some time, the government, you know, the, the, need, the kids need to go to school, uh, the market needs to be reopened, and the government will uh, have uh, pressure to 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 conduct eviction. And you know, the the disoccupation of these public buildings uh, may be something that needs to be that needs to be done eventually, but not in a disorganized way, not without of um, uh, alternatives for the IDPs. Uh, so there needs to be a strong uh, advocacy uh, effort uh, to prevent that from happening. So I think these are the three themes that there are um, around CCCM and HRP that I'd like to to explore. And uh, and I think they are they are covered they're well covered in the in the in the toolkits that the Melina is going to introduce uh, soon. And, and that's it from my side. Thanks, Abire. Uh, thank you for those uh, yeah, insights. Um, I imagine for most of you online and in the room, those are kind of challenges that sound familiar and uh, things that you have uh, you know, faced. Um, and uh, yeah, it'd be good to hear your experiences uh, later in the in the conversation. Um, so yeah, so Melina, I, I will hand over to you to present on the uh, toolkit and give a, an overview of it. So this is Melina Holder. She's an HLP consultant working with IOM. And I meant to say at the beginning, Melina, you're basically the, you know, you're definitely either the host or the co-host of this uh, this discussion. So if at any point, please do jump in and, and uh, take over. Um, you're very welcome. But yes, um, hand over to you, Melina. Um, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. And before I begin, I didn't know if you really wanted to show the e-courses or save that um, for the end first. Ibire, what do you want to do? This is oh, um, live collaborative process. I think it makes more sense for the toolkit to be presented now, and then um, and then I can present the the training uh, later. Great. Okay. Afterwards. Okay. Sounds sure. good. So I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, as Jim and Yvette mentioned, my name is Melina Holder, and um, I provide HLP support to IOM, Shelter, and CCCM teams. Um, I'll be providing a preview of the toolkit, the HLP toolkit for CCCM practitioners, and also a um, sneak peek of the CCCM cluster website, the um, online version of the toolkit, which should be available within the next week or two, which the, uh, we're very excited about. Um, so I think some of you in this room have already either been introduced to the toolkit or um, seen a presentation, so I won't go too deeply into the, the background and methodology and structure, um, but we do have like a four minute explainer video that goes um, deeper into that information that we can disseminate after this presentation if need be. Um, for those of you who have not been introduced to the toolkit, it was a collaborative effort between the CCCM clus cluster and the HLP AOI working group. Um, the goal of it was to kind of pull together any HLP resources, tools, and guidance that could be relevant to CCCM practice um, to kind of put together um, uh, guidance for addressing HLP issues in different types of um, CCCM phases. So from project planning, um, like due diligence, as Yvette was talking about, to um, camp closure and transition, responding to evictions, um, or just overcoming disputes and conflicts. Um, so I will just go right into it and kind of provide an example of how it can be used and then I will show um, I will show the online version. So as you can see, um, the the toolkit is structured in a way that there's an introduction to the toolkit um, that goes deeper into the methodology and background. 
Um, an overview of HLP and CCCM, kind of speaking to what Dara was talking about, the overlap, the importance of engaging between the two, um, different roles and responsibilities. And then the bulk of the document is centered around these thematic areas. So again, as Yvette was talking about due diligence, um, community representation and participation, women's inclusion, yeah. conflict management and mediation, camp closure and transition, urban displacement, eviction response and relocation, um, disability inclusion, and then a section for further reading. Um, so to show an example of how it can be used, um, you could go through and see what thematic area you were interested in. Maybe it's conflict management and mediation. Um, you can see a set of resources and tools that are available in these thematic areas, um, as well as an overview that will kind of describe the, um, the relevance of conflict management and mediation to HLP and CCCM. Uh, so maybe land tenure alternative conflict management is the resource that seems to be the most relevant. Um, each thematic area contains a context and a summary, so the context is intended to kind of briefly tell the reader if um, this resource is relevant to them. Um, so in this case, it could be useful for CCCM practitioners operating in areas where there are multiple types of tenure arrangements um, and where there are disputes and needs for mediation techniques. If that context seems like it, um, it's relevant and you want to know more about the resource, you could go to the summary, uh, which is really intended more to be a roadmap to the document rather than summarizing the content of the document itself. Um, so highlighting the important and relevant information um, and showing exactly where in that document that information is. Uh, so for example, to see a useful diagram illustrating the multiple layers and dimensions of land tenure conflicts um, that could be useful for CCCM practitioners. Uh, by the footnote, you could see that that would be on page 17 of the document, and then you could scroll to the bottom um, and be linked directly to the document itself. Um, to show an example of the due diligence resources and tools that this was a thematic area that you were interested in. Um, let me get back up to the due diligence section. <clears throat> You could see the resources and tools that are available here. Um, there is guidance on informal and self-settled sites, as was um, being discussed earlier. Uh, maybe you're interested in knowing more about tenure. So um, you could see that there's demystifying tenure for humanitarian practitioners. The context is um, a little broad here. So CC and practitioners that rely on using buildings or land, um, property or natural resources. So if you're unsure if this applies to you, you could go to the summary again and see kind of what useful information is there. So um, there is um, there's a chart providing um, detailed best practices for keeping records and working with third parties um, to verify information or assisting in dispute resolution. And again, from the footnote, you can tell exactly in that document um, what's in that document and where it is, um, and also the different scenarios that I provided. So this covers scenarios on burial sites, multiple claimants to a parcel, um, and places that have informal rental agreements. And then to show an example of more of the tool-based um, the tool-based resources that are in this document, for example, under eviction response and relocation, um, the tools are more usable item, items, items that can be adapted to different contexts, such as templates, matrices, um, sets of questions, um, not as much guidance notes and uh, reports like the resources. Um, so again, you could see what kind of tools are relevant to what you're looking for. Maybe you're um, mapping eviction risk. You could go to that section. You could see that there's a tool that's specifically for conducting an eviction risk assess assessment. See from the summary what kind of categories are in that tool and then be linked directly to that tool. Um, so, so as you can see, you can be linked directly to the tool. And then to show um, what this will look like online. So again, this is not yet live. This is just a, a sneak peek of what it will look like on the website, um, which again should be available very soon. Um, so this will be the landing page of the HLP toolkit. There's a brief introduction. And as you can see, all of the thematic areas are provided below. You'll be able to click on these areas and then um, have all of the resources and tools that were available in the PDF version. Um, and when this is live, you'll be able to, to, to click directly on it and be taken to that thematic area and everything that um, is provided in it. 
But for an example here, um, here's the due diligence landing page. So there's the overview on um, why conducting HLP due diligence is important for CCM practitioners um, and kind of the connection and relevancy of the two. And then below you can see um, the tools that are available uh, and each tool contains the context and summary that is provided in the toolkit. And then below will be the resources. So when you click on view resource, you'll be able to um, see those context and summaries again. And then the link to the document or the tool will be provided. Um, so we'll now hear the country operational perspectives of the toolkit, including um, how practitioners see the toolkit being used in practice, any recommendations or feedback for increasing its usefulness or adapting the toolkit to, um, to specific scenarios. Um, and we will first be hearing from Kazaya um, Barasa, from, who's the HLP AOR co-lead and HLP National Project Officer with IOM South Sudan. Um, and again, for a more detailed overview of the structure and background and methodology of the toolkit, um, we do have a video and a guidance note to complement the toolkit that can be disseminated after this. Um, so thank you so much, and I'll go ahead and hand it over. Sorry, Melina, just before Kizia comes in, I just wanted to uh remind or oh, to, to remind to to point out that the the toolkit was funded by gffo uh and so was the e-course the hrp e-course that we're going to present after kizia's presentation thanks kizia it's uh, the floor is yours and i will Thank um you. get your presentation up just one moment Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Melina and Ibere, for the introduction. I am Kezia Nasipondi. I work with the uh, IOM South Sudan Mission and also serving as the HLP AOR co lead alongside NRC as the lead and HDC as the co lead. I am pleased to be here today to share on uh, South Sudan. Uh, HLP operational context. Um, South Sudan faces uh, numerous ch challenges related to HLP, which are preliminarily caused by decades of conflict and displacement, uh, weak governance and limited access to justice, uh, posing many challenges, among them being what you're seeing before you on the screen today. Um, insecurity of tenure being the first one. Uh, most individuals and communities lack secure land tenure, which exposes them to risk of eviction and loss of property. Second is the land disputes, and these are due to lack of clear and transparent land administration system, uh, which has resulted in numerous land disputes, particularly in areas where natural resources are abundant. The third one is limited access to justice um, because the justice system in South Sudan is weak and many people lack access to affordable legal services and uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, fourth one is the lack of basic services uh, such as water, sanitation, and electricity, which affects the, their quality of life and makes it difficult uh, for them to have uh, their housing conditions that are more decent as it is required by the norms. Uh, then we have the final one for this day is a uh, high cost of housing because we have uh, building materials which are available and due to the high cost of living. So most of the people lack affordable financial options that makes it so difficult for them to access decent housing. Uh, recommendations uh, of how the CCCTM HLP toolkit can be used um, is to first uh, on the point is build capacity by training government officials, uh, other local uh, community authorities and civil societies. A second is raise awareness among general public about HLP rights and how to protect them. Third is support policy development, uh, supportive evidence for influencing HLP-related laws and policy change. 
Um, currently in South Sudan, we have reported this uh, to uh, some of the previous HLP AOR global sessions about the um, the, the current draft uh, South Sudan national land policy, which is uh, we hope that soon it will pass into law, but we'll keep on updating, which will be a milestone for the South Sudan context. Then we have the fourth one being providing guidance on dispute resolution by introducing mechanisms or tools to resolve disputes at the local levels or as a way of strengthening the local system. Finally, we have uh, improved service delivery in complex HLP context, especially given the fact that South Sudan is a volatile context with a lot of unpredictability due to the recovering from war and some parts still experiencing the unrest due to the fact that some of the civilians are still holding arms and this undermines the call for ceasefire then it will guide on navigating different types of tenure arrangements to provide essential services. That's all from my side, and thank you for listening. Over to you, Melina. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I think we can go into the... Um, the next presentation, which will be uh, Richard Arcello, who will be presenting um, Iowa Mozambique. And I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Melina. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, Dare. Ibere and Joseph, I think I know quite a number, uh, recently moved to Mozambique. And Jim, of course, and uh, Jim, I talked about you the other day in a HLP working group, and I might invite the two of you, you and Ibere here, to help us to demystify some of the HLP issues we're confronted with. Arrived here three weeks ago, and what I learned recently uh, one of the districts, uh, the authorities are locating plots of land to the IDPs uh, who wish to return or resettle with um, a fee. Uh, but there's nothing documented. There's no security of tenancy. Uh, so even if you pay that amount of money, the likelihood of being evicted is quite high. Uh, quite a number of IDPs that were in a displacement site that is prone to flooding uh, were relocated by the authorities. Again, they simply verbally allocate land uh, for them to set up plots in the host community uh, agricultural land, what they call the mashambas. Uh, two weeks down the road when the shelters have been pitched up, uh, then most of the IDPs have been displaced and then they have to go back to the, the, the sites that are normally flooded. Uh, these are some of the issues that uh, we are confronted with and the, the working group has just been reconstituted the third time. Of course, it's co-led by NRC and, and UNSCR, not really the protection cluster, but the UNSCR. A number of uh, years they would reconstitute and then would uh, crumble, they would crumble. But uh, last week was our first meeting uh, where we put to, to task to do a number of things. One, to have a proper analysis to understand the HLP issues that are uh, affecting the IDPs in, in, in Mozambique. And uh, I should have said in the beginning that uh, the displacement, the conflict displacement only happened in northern Mozambique, in one, uh, one region called Cabo Delgado. Our other regions are, are pretty stable apart from the natural disaster. So mainly those affected by HLP issues are conflict displaced IDPs. So we're also developing uh, four Ws. We want to understand uh, who is working on uh, 
HLP issues here, but also to look at uh, the, the activities, but also the activities that you're doing that uh, affects the, the, the IDPs. We also planning to, to do a presentation of the toolkit. Our next meeting is in May. On May 4th, we will be presenting the toolkit. Then I will have to reach out to Melina. Again, thanks to Ibere for uh, making it very simple. The three thematic areas that you, you've, uh, you've presented in the beginning. So uh, just to summarize, my, my talking point is that uh, there's enormous HLP issues in uh, northern Mozambique, but then the working group is not as uh, strong as it should have been. And But there's good appetite for, for, for us to take the HLP issues ahead. Uh, we will also have the, the core lead of HLP to have a presentation to the CCCM partners because, you know, one thing that really happened, we, a site is identified, we do the site planning, we do not do the due diligence, whether uh, there's going to be permanency, a plot of land is just allocated to a family without consideration, because this is more an agrarian society, they depend on agriculture. If they are not able to access agricultural land, and they don't have that security of tenancy is a, a little bit problematic. Uh, one of the sites, uh, the government has stopped uh, humanitarian distribution of food and, and shelter items. There are over 74,000 IDPs. A quick analysis of this community realize only 2,400 have access to agricultural land. The rest, depend on humanitarian aid and will be forced to either return or to go to cities to, to beg. So if the HLP issues are not handled for this kind of population, about 70,000 of them, so we would have a big issue to, to, to deal with. So briefly, that is my learning of the weeks here. Uh, thank you again, uh, Melanie, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you for sharing it with your colleagues and um, sharing the context for Mozambique. And we will next hear from Carlos Galindo, who will be sharing the context um, from Honduras. So thank you, Carlos, for being here. Thank you and good uh, afternoon and good evening and good morning here in Honduras and Central America it's around uh, 646 AM. I will share my screen. And uh, for Honduras, um, the HLP operational perspectives, uh, Honduras is under three scenarios, uh, hurricane and tropical storm, migrants in transit, return needs. Um, migrant Honduras uh, uh, from uh, national Honduras from the United States and Mexico. In the photo on the left, you can see a CAN for IDPs in response to tropical storm Eta and Iota that impacted uh, Honduras in 2020. Uh, this uh, this land was uh, was private. It was uh, was leased by 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 the owner to the local municipality, and they only for for six months maximum. This is the map of Honduras. It's located in uh, in the heart of uh, Central America, especially uh, most of the north of the country. Uh, it's impacted by hurricanes and tropical storms. But we already have uh, migrant in transit, uh, uh, people coming from Haiti, Cuba, Venezuela, and Ecuador that cross uh, the south border between Honduras and, and Nicaragua. That is uh, the second scenario, and we, we already have um, returning migrants in the, in the north of, uh, of the country. So, uh, some photo from floating caused by tropical storm Eta and Iota. Uh, in 2020, more than 1,000 collective centers were habilitated as temporary housing, most of them schools. And uh, regarding to the CCCM Housing and Land Property Toolkit, uh, Section 3.1.2 mentioned that schools are the risky uh, type of public building for eviction. And the government are looking for, for a school. They are looking for some center like community centers or, or some 
spaces for, for the community. Uh, but there is a challenge because the infrastructure is not enough for for all the for all the country. But they are changing, not using more any schools and using uh, community centers. This is the second scenario in Danli, Honduras, uh, the south of the country. Um, a religious center used as housing for migrants in transit from July 2020 until January uh, 2023. Um, but uh, at the end of, of the last year, uh, the Catholic Church uh, sent a, a letter to the government and said uh, this center cannot be used anymore as uh, a center for migrants in transit. So the government uh, was uh, looking for another land, and a land was donated by local municipality of, of Danli to the National Institute of Migration. And regarding to the so the toolkit for a similar situation in the future will be useful to use the eviction tracking template mentioned in section 3.7.3 uh, of the CCCM HLP toolkit in the case of, of the of the shelter in the in the image. So this this template is, is very useful because you could track all all very aspect of the eviction and for sure in the future will be great. This is a uh, uh, area photo of the of the can of this previous can and they are uh, using this is the cam installation for migrants in transit uh, using uh, air hu units the capacity is for 400 uh, migrants in transit they stay only one or two tonight and they they continue to go to to the united states but we, we also have returning migrants from Mexico and the United States, um, Honduran people. There are two co main collective centers for temporary housing of this population. They could stay one, two, or maximum three days because they coming back to their communities. In Camerre Omoa, for example, this is one of the centers. It's a property confiscated by government due to money laundering and converting a point of enter and temporary housing for Honduras returned only adults by bus from, from Mexico. And I want to mention that Ever uh, um, Lopez already mentioned that the government said to the UN agency and some other uh, organization that you could do um, infrastructure work, but only temporary works because of this, uh, this, uh, this, this property. And the second is a collective center also belongs to a gover governmental institution focused on children and receive family units and accompanying children returning by airplanes or buses. The main challenges for Honduras, the insecurity of tenure, land dispute, legal insecurity, a lack of back basic services in rural areas, especially in the in the south border in Dali and the, the picture that I already presented to you and the cost the cost of housing has, has increased uh, 45 until 50 percent in one point years is because uh, most of the construction materials in Honduras are imported but also a lot of uh, qualified workers for example a technician mason electrician are emigrating to to, to another countries and especially United States and, and Spain also. The toolkit can be used for build capacity, and for sure a workshop for CCCM members and IOM is leading the CCCM cluster here in Honduras and the co-leader is the Honduran Red Cross. Raise awareness, uh, support policy and development, provide guidance on dispute resolution, also improve the service delivery in complex HLP. Some recommendation uh, about highlight potential impact of climate change on housing, land and property, also location of settlement in safe area using uh, GIL tools like SOAR, like RGs or QGs, and also translation in Honduras, uh, we speak uh, Spanish, and I think the translation of the CCCN uh, housing and land property toolkit to Spanish will be very useful. And I know that there in the toolkit there are a resources, but maybe the, the main resources and tool of the eight thematic area could be translated um, according to, to the context of Honduras. Next steps, 
on CCCCN HLP uh, toolkit for Honduras. The document has already shared internally within IOM colleagues related to programs uh, that work for retro needs, migrant transit, and emergency due to disasters. And the CCCN cluster in Honduras, led by IOM, is coordinated with N N NRC. Honduras, a workshop based in the, docu the document, the Mystifying Tenure for Humanitarian Practitioner, Section 316. And in the next monthly session of the CCCN cluster of Honduras, IOM will present briefly this toolkit before sending it by email to a humanitarian practitioner member when the toolkit is already um, ready in the, in the website. Over to you, Melina. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Carlos, and uh, thank you for the recommendations and also for joining so early in the morning your time. Uh, we will next hear from IOM uh, Peru, um, from Adriana Alegre, but uh, she was summoned to the field this morning, actually, so we have a recording of her presentation, and I'll be sharing um, the recording and her, her PowerPoint. So I will go ahead and get that set up and then share my screen. Alina, I think you might have to unmute so that we can um, hear from your side. Location of the HLP toolkit in Peru. Sorry, can you hear now? Um, I yeah, can we have to start it again? Thanks. Online because um, we are currently in an emergency response here in Peru. Uh, sorry about that. I'll restart. Hi, my name is Adriana Alegre. I'm the Shelter and CCCM assistant at IOM Lima, Peru. Um, I'm thankful with uh, Melina for giving me some minutes to talk to you about the application of the HLP toolkit in Peru. Um, I apologize, I won't be able to be online because um, we are currently in an emergency response here in Peru. Um, but I will be very short talking about uh, the, this application. Um, we have been working with Melina on, on the creation of the of those um, HLP toolkit, and we are uh, we're very happy that the experience here in Lima have uh, um, helped to create this this content. Um, we implemented last year a uh, rental assistance project, which has been one of the, um, I think, uh, for us also, it has been one of the um, proof of how this uh, HLP is, um, topic is very important and it is how, how it is related to the uh, implementation of those kind of projects. Uh, we, we, during this, uh, the implementation of this project, we realized that um, although it's not related to owning a place, um, it is very close related to the rental part of, of renting a place. Um, migrants and refugees from Venezuela they they have this um very big problem in finding a place not only because they rush to peru they they sometimes um they have to be in a shelter for a while until they get the tools and the resources to find a place but when they want to find a place then they have those different um barriers for example, um, the nationality is um, if they have um, a lot of children, if, if 
and I get a uh, LGBTIQ family member in the family if there is uh, any disease um, or disability that that it's um, that make um, more difficult for them to find a place. So what they have been doing is that um, they they stayed in, in places that are not safe and that doesn't um, fulfill the minimum habitability criteria. So we have been working on this um, on this problem with the rental assistance and the first and the main important thing is um, trying to um, go against the informality that that we have in Peru and probably in many other countries in Latin America. The, the informality in the market is very huge and either because uh, if landlords, which is uh, a local community, they don't want to pay taxes, so they avoid the fact that they are renting a place and they kind of do it in, um, um, I don't know, in, in silence. And then the the families also, they they prefer to stay in a small room. And that, to, it doesn't matter if it's a big family, but they can stay in a big, in a, a small room as long as they pay less, or as long as they don't ask for documents, or and they accept not having a contract and not having a receipt. Some of the things that we have implemented in, in this project is um, the the templates of contract template of um, receipts that will allow them to uh, to have a proof of payment so they don't get evicted without notice. Um, we have made some uh, trainings with with, uh, with migrants and refugees about their, uh, their rights on renting a place, what they should ask for, what are the minimum um, availability criteria, um, and what they should demand from the landlord. And as well to the landlord, we have also created this, um, some um, tools for them to also have uh, a, the tools that they, they, they need, the, the proof that they also need for uh, or do what they should ask of if they are renting to uh, the place to a family. And we discussed all those topics, the eight, uh, thematic areas that you have seen here during the CCCM training in Lima that we have in February this year. This was um, the first time we present the toolkit to um, IOM staff and some other organizations that work closely, local organizations that, that work closely with IOM in, in CCCM uh, response as well as local authorities like um, um, INDESI, Ministerio de la Mujer, Ministerio de Vivienda, among others, and also others, um, UN agencies, as UNHCR. And we, all these um, organizations that were united in, in February, we all work in, in CCCN response, and we discuss um, the, those topics, specifically what happened after the camp closure and how should we uh, work to avoid eviction um, and what should we do about it. So those were the, the main topics that we discussed. And as I mentioned, we all work in this um, in shelter and CCCM. So, we we were um, wondering on on what else should we do, and we have the compromise also to um to share with our teams. And next month we will have the next um R four B meeting, which is the response for Venezuela, and we will present again the HLP toolkit 
but all the um, local organizations that work in, in this response. And currently, we are leading the CCCM cluster in the response of this emergency that I mentioned before. And we will also present this, the HLP toolkit, during the next round table that we will have. Because many of the camps are getting close. Um, they're they're uh, closing to, to uh, because people is um, either um, receiving uh, some help or some aid from the government, or because they were able to either clean the house, um, rent another place in in a safe safety area, or stay with their relatives. And we find now it is the the is the time to start talking about about this. So those have been some of the moments that we have used the toolkit. I'm pretty sure we will be keep using it. Um, and we will be sharing this um, this helpful uh, tool with all our partner organizations. Um, thank you and. Have a good day. Um, so thank you, Adriana, for preparing that recording and that presentation um, last minute when she realized that she could not be here in person. Um, and just thank you to uh, Kazaya, Carlos, Richard, and Adriana for already sharing the toolkit with your colleagues and taking the time to present your context and feedback um, on the toolkit so far. And I'll now hand it over to Jim um, and everyone online and everyone in the room um, kind of open for discussion, feedback, um, questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Melina. Thanks, presenters. Really great to hear how um, the toolkit's being looked at and used. Um, and I think that's, you know, Melina, you said it at the beginning, but worth saying again, this is a, a kind of a, a living document. It's born out of acknowledgement that there are so many different kind of tools and um, guidance and, and things that have been developed by different agencies, by different actors over many years that could be useful. And we wanted to try and bring them together in one place and, and then uh, provide some guidance sort of through those. So um, it, it's, it's yeah, been a, a sense of trying to consolidate. Um, one of the things that's come up from those presentations is, uh, you know, there's different ways in which this could be useful. So, you know, as part of training, as well as something that you might pass on to others as you're uh, sort of handing things over to them. Um, and, and it'd be great to get ideas from colleagues online and in the room around how this could be shared more, how you see it being used, um, what sort of feedback or comment you might have on, on, on this whole kind of project, this whole idea. Um, something that's come up definitely is that, that request and need for, to think about translation. And um, I mean, that doesn't apply just to this toolkit. I think it's a, uh, um, a real significant issue for um, yeah, many of the areas that we're working in here as well. So, um, so that's well noted, and, and we'll have to to look at that and see what might be possible to to do with the translation side because it's really important. But yeah, open to comments, suggestions, uh, perspectives, um, and I noticed there's some uh, questions being posed in the chat uh, around some issues that we can we can come to. Um, in a moment, potentially, but yeah, open to, to reflections. Um, Marina, Jim, if, if I may, since I did not see hands uh, for questions, I want to give more space, but maybe I will start with a question for uh, for all of us here. Um, well, first, really great examples. It just shows how things are being implemented operationally in different places and we are learning and then in the end of the day also it shows the fruit of your great work you know um, uh, Melena, Jim and, and all the colleagues who have been developing different guidances. Um, I was wondering because in a couple of situations indeed we always think about the HLP issues between the um, the cluster, the IDPs vis-a-vis -vis the authorities, sometimes the host community etc. But in a couple of occasions actually even potentially created some tensions and was a point of discussion between CCCM and the other clusters. Um, and we have been finding ourselves, I personally remember that we had discussions in, in occasions where IDPs were occupying schools 
And when IDPs were living in hospitals, where the cluster coordinators came to us to say, as a cluster, we would like you to come with a statement or with actions to take the IDPs out of these places. And we said, the IDPs are always seen as people we are accountable to serve, people who are concerned as people are in need, and uh, the image entirely changes completely, even within the humanitarian actors vis-a-vis -vis those IDPs once they are in these kind of buildings, because the for reasons we understand, the, the other clusters sometimes see that the presence of IDPs in these premises sometimes are hindering the IDPs, the, 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 the humanitarian actors from delivering services to other people in need. It looks very complex, but I was wondering whether anybody wanted to uh, to take the floor to give us uh, any insights if they have had any similar experiences or how they have dealt with it. Over. Thanks, so who's going to answer that one? I mean, if no one else wants, I can, <laughs> I can answer from my side. Uh, there, good question. I uh, I remember in uh, I I went through this in in its team or I mean, many years ago, no, twenty years ago, um, where IDPs were occupying the only hospital in in the capital, right? And uh, and there was not only an issue for the for the host community, but also for the IDPs themselves because they were uh, at risk. There was a, a cholera outbreak, and they you know they they were risking their health by by being in that environment. So it's a tricky situation, but I guess um, the oh in that case the solution was to provide um, a planned camp for them to stay in. So there was uh, you know there, there was a time frame to prepare the site and and they moved. But um, but indeed when you have that there was a small country with a small IDP population, but when you have hundreds of thousands and several camps, and then it's much more complex. So uh, yeah, good point. Thanks. Um, I think, is it Jacini? I see your hands raised. Did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, thank you, Jim. Thank you, colleague. Yeah, uh, I've also been in uh, such situation, I think, uh, severely. Uh, I think, uh, let me start with the uh, uh, earlier one, and then I come to the recent one. Uh, we've had situation where we had uh, IDPs occupying schools uh, within uh, Medugui metropolitan town, which is like the major uh, city in uh, Bagno, one of the most heat uh, affected uh, location within uh, uh, the Northeast. And uh, because these IDPs were occupying the schools, school activity could not resume. So uh, on one side, we are trying to see how to ensure that the right of these IDPs are being protected against being evicted. And on the other side, uh the children are being denied access to education so uh we, we we found ourselves in a kind of dilemma and uh one of uh the challenge we had was trying to get uh a very suitable place to accommodate uh, these idps because we have these idps who are, are large in number and so getting a space to accommodate uh, all of them uh, in one uh, location was a challenge, and we don't want to like create that displacement among them, uh, whereby we may have to move some to other location where while some are being uh, kept in other location. Uh, but at the end of uh, the day, I think we just have to decide uh, for them because we had series of consultation uh, with them uh, at that time. Uh, uh, we could not uh, get like a, a, a kind of uh, consensus that uh, both parties that uh, for us and for them uh, will be suitable. And at, at the end of the day, we just have to like uh, move them into one of the formal uh, government camp within the town. Uh, I think this this is the case of uh, the uh, Malay Galtomari school, uh, which was occupied by IDP. And just recently, uh, not more than a week, uh, we are having a similar situation in one of the LGAs uh, within uh, Bagno State uh, and Gala, uh, whereby uh, the, 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 there is much constraint of land uh, due to the security challenge that is there. And uh, the town is being uh, surrounded by trenches because of the nature of the security there. 
and uh, these IDPs are living in uh, one of the, uh, it's a private owned Arabic school. And now uh, the school want to resume activity and then uh, it issue an eviction notice uh, to the IDPs copying even the government uh, of the LDA and also the state authorities. Uh, we will also serve a copy of that uh, later. And uh, now uh, we have to also uh, plead with the school, plead with the government to try to see how uh, we can get uh, a space for these people. Currently, we're still working on that, even though uh, the government has intervened to get uh, more time while we try to get a solution together with the shelter this system. Uh, sector because uh, the location uh, of consign is a place uh, where there's heightened security. Uh, just yesterday, uh, we had attack uh, whereby uh, one of the INGO staff was picked and uh, we've not had information about that. So it's uh, a very uh, tricky uh, issue per se. Uh, I'll just uh, stop here. Uh, over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Very good example. Thank you. And I see in the chat also that um, Kaziah has her hand up if you want to contribute. Thank you. I'll give an example of uh, South Sudan, uh, especially during COVID-19, um, at a time whereby also uh, it happened and we still had IDPs in uh, church and uh, some were in schools. Um, due to the COVID-19 situation, uh, they were given an eviction notice by the church and uh, uh, some had to go and host in school as they were not sure as to whether the areas of uh, origin are safe for their returns or not. So uh, basically dealing with the presence of IDPs in such uh, uh, social uh, amenities or um, public institutions uh, can be challenging, but uh, there are several steps that uh, we undertake as a housing, land and property technical working group at the state level. Uh, first was to assess the situation and analyze the needs, then uh, engage the communities where these IDPs had, um, uh, maybe they come from their areas of origin for those who are within the state, so that uh, together as a joint team, we could be able to identify possible solutions on how to secure a safe environment for them to go to or and those who don't come from those areas of origin can be reintegrated therein. And then uh, this is where uh, we called uh, other partners uh, so that we can provide uh, necessary resources to be able to attend to the IDPs who are in need. And also for those who are still in school and uh, because they couldn't go to the to the identified locations because they were not origins of those areas, but they came from other states outside uh, where we are operating. Uh, they remained within the school because at that time during COVID there was a lockdown, but they kept on staying there until now it was time for education to resume. So the community leaders uh, had to come in and provide alternative education options and find other um, uh, edu uh, public institutions, which were like public facilities, which were vacant and could accommodate uh, students for the time being. Uh, so uh, overall, addressing the uh, presence of IDPs in areas like schools, hospitals, and church is uh, uh, mostly it requires a collaborative effort uh, from the facilities and uh, communities and then the external uh, support by the stakeholders 
and also other key relevant uh, actors who are active during the implementation process on the ground. Because I believe like by working together to identify and uh, implement solutions is uh, possible to create a safe and supportive environment uh, for both the institution holders and the IDPs. So this is the approach that we undertook uh, in South Sudan context, especially during COVID-19. Thank you and over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Faze. Great question. Some good answers. And um, yeah, if you have access to the chat, there's some uh, uh, comments in there as well. And uh, Bruce mentioned the uh, CCCM cluster undertaking a joint research project with the education cluster about the use of schools as collective centres. So that could be interesting to read when it is up on the website in May uh, and get on the mailing list apparently to uh, receive it. Maybe tell us how we do that in the chat. In the chat there we go, perfect. Look in the chat if you wanna get on the mailing list. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, we've got about 10 or 11 minutes left. I want to go back to you, Abire, to ask if you might present a little bit on the um, the training modules that have been developed, um, because they well, they may well be of interest uh, for, for those of us here. So, yeah, uh, over to you to share something on that. And then again, we can have a, a few minutes of reaction and response after. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, I do hope that there will be of interest. We've been working on on this for quite a while, and um, it's um, so. So the idea was to to produce a, a training, uh, sort of an e-course actually, because it's a it's a training with four modules uh, on uh, on HRP in situations of displacement, and the training is uh, in the form of an interactive video, uh, almost like a video game that in first person. Um, so you watch a few videos that will situate you in a certain context of displacement. And then uh, you're put in the position of a, a responder, first responder uh, that has to deal with with land and property issues in the response. So the first module is on fund HRP fundamentals. Then we have uh, the second one on security of tenure. The third one is uh, return and restitution. So all the issues regarding the land and property that were that was left behind by the IDPs. And the fourth one is um, women's access to land. So um, tackling the, the issues of um, uh, women and, um, and, the, and as they try to recover their rights to the property that they left behind. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, explain that we did a soft launch of this training to test and um, it's been uh, received well. Um, we, we, we released it internally first at, in IOM and also in the Global Shutter Cluster website. Uh, but we will soon be, I hope, in the AOR website as well um, and of open access. I'm going to um, show you how more, uh, I'm going to show you how to play. Let me share my screen here. Can you see the screen? Yeah. So on the website, you just click play. Uh, you click play on this one, right? Because this one is mine. You click play here. Yeah. And then uh, you see the intro video. Which will situate the, the the emergency. So there will be a, a breaking news, um, uh, sort of like a, a a breaking news on TV, and uh, the presenter. There's no sound, but the presenter will. There's no sound in here, but then the, the game there's sound. The presenter will talk about this emergency and how the you know hundreds of uh, IDPs displaced, and uh, there will be a there will be a, a, a the the rainy season is coming, and you have two days to find uh, uh, an alternative site for the IDPs to move, to be in safety. So, um, and then, uh, and then uh, after that, sorry, can someone uh, uh, mute your microphone? Maybe Hibo, if you can mute your microphone, that'd be great. Done. Done. Good. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. And then, and then after that, um, after that uh, intro introductory video, then uh, we'll we'll be placed in in a, in an office where we receive an email um, saying that you have two days to complete the task, which is to find the um, to find the to locate the the land or the building where the the IDPs can be re relocated to. Right. 
Um, and then you have three options. You can either um, you can either go to um, to um, uh, either go to an empty land. Um, well, can you see the screen now or no? We can now. We had your subtle infiltration of shelter cluster uh, propaganda. But apart from that, we're now <laughs> on to, yeah, the CCCM. I'm joking, of I, course. But um, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, now we're back on your video. Right. So, so this is where. So after the introductory video, you come to this screen here, which is your desk, right? And then you open that. You're gonna open the email, and there will be your mission in the email. So they will tell you what you what you need to do. Uh, you read the email. And it's going to explain that um, the rainy season is coming, and you have to um, you have to find an, an alternative site. And you need to get authorization to use the new site for 18 months. So that means you need to do quite a bit of uh, due diligence, but you only have two days to do it, right? And there will be a countdown um, on your on your time. Then you, you close the email and you go back to your office. And then on the cork board, that's where the three options are, right? So you can see that calendar, you only have two days. And then on the cork board, that's where your options are. You can go to the abandoned village, the empty plot of land, or the apartment block. And as you choose these options, inside these options, you're gonna have actions that you can take, right? So you can um, you can talk to someone, uh, talk to different characters from different um, authorities, and uh, and you have to. And that's how you go through the game. Every module has the same structure. So we have an introduction, and then you have your office and your mission. Uh, and that, that's how you go through the game. It takes about 40 minutes to go through it, to go through the four modules. And um, uh, and they are available now on uh, on the public website. But we're going to do a proper launch later on when when the when the game is already on the AOR website. Great. Thank you um, for sharing that. And um, yeah, I don't know how many people have had a go, but it's almost genuinely quite fun and intriguing and um, also really helpful to explain to other people a little bit about what some of the practical you know, things that people are having to deal with and, and, and what this actually means in, in, in real, <laughs> apart from using technical language. So yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Abire. Um, we've got about five minutes left for uh, further comments, questions. Um, Joseph, if you're still online, I know you asked your question in the chat, but you can uh, feel free to ask it again out loud um, if you would like, um, or if anyone else wants to come in and uh, uh, either react to that that training and the toolkit or, or anything else that's uh, uh, coming up for you right now. Yes, please. Now, I don't know quite how this room is working. You might have to come over here. Um, I can bring it to you if you want. Those online, we're having to try and work out the uh, mic. Hi, this is Barbara McCallan. I'm DRC's Global Advisor on HLP. I just wanted to say I've done the training that Ibere just presented. It's really fun. I mean, for me, it took me more than 40 minutes because I went back, you know, changed the selection of option. And I think it's really good because it's fun to do. Uh, the video, the way it's done, the video, the breaking news, it's, it's all super engaging. And it manages to be at the same time, you know, using plain terms to explain the situation. So completely demystifying the, you know, the tenure uh, complexity and all this. And and also you have extra resources at the end of each module, which, you know, if you want to go further, and that's why it took me more than 40 minutes, uh, you can dig more into all these issues, you know, and they tell you, OK, maybe you chose A, but if you had chosen B, um, this is the pros and cons of choosing this and that. And I think also the challenge of you only have a certain amount of time. I think it's good because, you know, it's not like you're a researcher, yeah. uh, you know, and you have so many days to, to check the situation. So it forces you to say, OK, is it better if I go to the land registry, knowing that probably the land reg registry is inaccurate, outdated, well, doesn't correspond to reality? Or should I just go to, you know, the neighbors of this village or... So, yeah, it's great. Well done. And do it, everybody. <laughs> great. We will all go through the training. That's a great comment from the colleagues. Well done, Iberi, and uh, whoever was involved in the preparation of that training and its design. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. Um, yes, any other comment, insight, reflection? 
feels quite exciting having um, these resources collected together and um, feels like real sort of momentum a around this issue. And uh, yeah, just that further emphasis on that the sort of collaborative uh, need uh, yeah, for us to keep working together. Richard, please. Yes, come in. Thank you, Jim. No, um, my request was to Melina. It looks like there's a big appetite now for the toolkit, uh, particularly for partners who are operating in CCCM, and they would want to pick a few, few things that they need to, to, to implement. And uh, I was wondering if we have an average uh, presentation, two or three slides that are talking about the toolkit. Just like the themes that you better as uh, explaining, those are the things that will increase people's appetite to read the toolkit and utilize it, and then we'll get a lot of requests. Wondering if you want to make those slides and share, or we, I don't know, over to you. Um, I do have a presentation that kind of briefly goes over the the background aim and audience methodology and explains the structure of the toolkit. So I can share that in the chat. Um, there's also, I also shared, a, there's a one page document that kind of goes through it as well, the same information, just not in the presentation format. And then we also have the video, but I will share, um, I will share some slides if you think that would be the best way to kind of um, bring people into looking at the toolkit. So I can share that in the chat. Thanks, and probably worth saying that once it's up live on the CCCM website as well, we can you know, think really carefully about how we want to really sort of share that, what opportunities there are to either do some events around it or or keep pushing. Um, yeah, with the shelter cluster, for example, Stephanie, thank you for that comment, um, and the AOR, of course, and, and others as well. We can maybe like look at how we can work together. It'd be great to have your ideas and thoughts on that as, as, as we move forward. Um, but yeah, brilliant. Um, I think that's yeah, that'd be that'd be great to think how we do that. It might be we need to, you know, we have the video, it might be good to create, yeah, a couple mm -hmm. of slides that allow almost like a trainer of trainer type approach. Maybe we can look at thinking about that. Um, but yeah, great, thank you. Any other questions just before we close or comments, reflections? Thank you. I keep seeing various movements, so I can't tell if people are putting their hands up or if they're dancing or, or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much um, to all our presenters uh, for joining us. Um, uh, yeah, from 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 all over South Sudan, Mozambique, Honduras, Peru, and for the others who've spoken. And yeah, thanks so much for a really interesting conversation. And uh, we keep looking at ways to share this and develop it. And it's live document, so inputs are welcome. Uh, yeah, and thanks everyone for for being here. We'll be sharing the recording and the slides and any other resources, let us know. Great, thank you. Thank Cheers. you, Jim. Thanks, Cheers. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Enjoy Geneva. Thank you.